Hey everybody, welcome back. Hope you're having an outstanding day because today is episode four in our series on reticulated pythons. And today we're going to be talking about housing and enclosures. Now, this is a topic that I dare say may be controversial simply because there's a really diverse range of opinions on enclosures for reticulated pythons. A lot of that depends on who you ask. If you ask a breeder, they're going to have one opinion. If you ask a keeper, they're going to have another opinion. And there's a, there's a huge range in between. There's just a couple things that we need to keep in mind that are basics that need to exist, whichever path we take. So those are some of the things that we're going to talk about today on Intrepid Exotics. Whether you're a lifelong keeper or just getting started, help us encourage responsible keeping, conservation, and public education in the interest of keeping our reptiles safe and healthy as we protect them for future generations. You're invited to spend time with us as we experience these awesome animals together on Intrepid Exotics. Okay, so let's see if we can keep this video under an hour. <laughs> My goal with this series is to keep everything right around 10 minutes. I have not been successful at that yet, and when it comes to enclosures, I have no expectation of being successful this time either. Um, so hang on. I'm going to make it as brief as I can, and I think what we're going to do with this is I'm going to leave out the extremes. You can show examples of really bad housing. You can show examples of really good housing, and there's a median in there. Some of the things that you'll hear, and I think this is probably a fairly decent gauge, is that the enclosure should be big enough for the snake to extend fully down one side and the front of the enclosure. So say for instance, this right here is my four foot Burmese Python, and this is a four foot enclosure by two foot. So I'm gonna keep her in there until she's six foot, meaning she's gonna cover that four foot there, all the way back to the back of the enclosure. Once she gets about six feet long, we're gonna move her up and kind of keep doing that until she reaches her mature age, um, which works out really good because, you know, if you've got space to move them up into a newer enclosure, then you've got that other one open, you put something else in it, like my other four foot enclosure. When I first got, um, when I first got her, I kept her in this four footer for a little while, but now, I keep a ball python in there. I don't have to worry about upgrading her. She's perfectly content in there. There's plenty of space for her. She's not gonna get any bigger than that. But kind of the way I set my guys up is, my first preference is I always prefer sliding doors. Um, I've been in places that have had a lot of these drop down doors, and these can be really difficult sometimes, especially if you've got a really reactive animal, when it comes time to feed, if you're dropping these doors like this and you've got the meal right here, and you pretty much, <laughs> you can, you can sit off to the side like this, but I just, I don't like the way they've got all that space to work with if you've got a really reactive animal. If you've got a sliding door and you can step off to the side, give yourself just enough room to get in there, you've got an opening this big instead of that whole part of the enclosure. I mean, I've, I've been feeding animals before where I've dropped that thing down, hung a prey item, and they can just shoot right out of there. Um, yeah. you, you can manage it. It's not terrible, but um, like I said, my preference is the sliding. There's just a couple things that you need to make sure that you're providing for these snakes in their enclosures. Um, you've got to make sure that you're able to maintain humidity for them. You've got to have an ample enough water supply and a temperature gradient. And the temperature gradient, the, the best way that I've found to do that is on this enclosure, I use a top mounted 140 watt radiant heat panel up top here. And you can see I've got this basking platform right here and it sits directly under that heating element. And so you've got, you got the radiant heat panel, you've got the basking platform here and I keep the uh, thermostat probe at the level of the basking platform. So what I try and do is I set this so that she's got, when she's sitting on that platform, she's as close as she's ever gonna be to that radiant heat panel 
and that temperature right there is you know hovering right close to 90 degrees um, a little bit less you know I'd say 87 to 90 degrees something like that and that does a couple things especially in an enclosed space like this one it means that that heater doesn't have to work as hard um, it's not heating that whole enclosure up to 83 degrees it's heating just below that thing and then it's cutting off so that's one plus another thing is is that it allows for a wider temperature gradient inside the enclosure because this is going to be a direct heat right here She's also got the opportunity to reduce the temperature slightly by getting down underneath the blast, the basking platform. That's going to drop the temperature some more. And then she's got an opportunity to get over here all the way on the other side of the enclosure. And I keep this room right here between 76 and 80 degrees ish, something like that. Um, so she's going to have her coolest spot over here. And then of course the water that I, the water dish that I put in there for her, Believe it or not, even a 14 foot snake, even earlier today, she was completely curled up in that and just happy as a lark. So that'll actually cool them down more. So this setup gives them, I think, the widest temperature gradient that you can for them inside an enclosure. And they will definitely use that entire gradient regularly. Um, I've got all three of my big snakes set up this way um, right now. Her, of course, she's she's just crazy. She wants to get out and run around, so she's all over the place. Right now, my big male retig is sitting right directly underneath the uh, heat panel, and the berm is curled up in his water bowl right now. Um, and you'll see them all move around all over their enclosures. So I think that's a really good thing to do. Now, I also, you'll notice, is I keep them on paper. And I think that's what a lot of people really do with their larger constrictors is using paper as substrate. And for me, there's a couple reasons for that. Um, one, I've seen various types of substrate used before, and I have seen impactions caused um, because of that substrate. Now, that's not saying, you know, you may be able to keep your snake on, on a cypress mulch or something like that indefinitely and never have that problem. But I have seen it before. And I, I can say that neither one of my retics or my berm have ever really gotten sick on me. I've had really mild respiratory infections before that cleared up really quickly. Um, and that was on, I think it was on my male retic. But it's been so long ago, I don't even remember. Um, when, you, when you're putting these guys on paper and you're paying attention to it and you're changing it regularly, it's real easy to keep that enclosure pretty sterile, keeps it pretty clean, and you'll see just like she was doing earlier, well, just like she's doing now too. Now, oh, that's what it is. I think she's getting ready to start shedding. That's why she was sitting in her water and she's pushing a little bit. Oh, so she should start shedding on me here pretty quick. Yeah, and, and I can't say that substrate necessarily causes problems. I think it's more of an issue that it exacerbates problems, other problems that arise. Um, so say for instance, your snake gets mites, okay? Um, that substrate is going to make it more difficult to get rid of those mites. Say for instance, your snake gets a respiratory infection and they start drooling a little bit, okay? They may be getting uncomfortable. They've already got that drool there, which means as they move through there, that stuff's gonna adhere to them where it otherwise wouldn't. And if they start pushing and they get some of that substrate in there and they start driving that into their gums and they're pushing, that's when you'll see these really nasty growths that they'll get on their mouths. I've seen some retics before in different places that just pushed and pushed and pushed until they had massive growths on their mouths. Um, some of them just don't know when to stop. So again, I find paper just a lot easier to manage and honestly I think it's I think it's the most sterile the, the cleanest way to keep your animals so now that being said too you're gonna hear a lot about hides when we talk about enclosures um, and you're gonna see actually up here on my male ball python he's got two hides in his enclosure over here there's a heat mat underneath it so that's his hot hide that's his cool hide he spends most of his time in his cool hide 
or in his water bowl. So I've got I've got those different hides there available for him. And the reason why we do that is if you've got a if you've got a timid snake and they just they don't feel secure unless they're in a hide. If you've only got one on a hot side or only got one on a cool side, then they've got no option to regulate their temperature. According to them, the way they think, they need to hide. And the temperature is what the temperature is. If they're comfortable, like this one is, like you can see, he's all over the place. He's going to, you know, bounce between the hides as he wants to increase or decrease his temperature. And you do the same thing. I've got the same thing here for my Burmese python. And if I had a reticulated python in that enclosure, I'd do the same thing with them as well. You know, she's got a warm hide and a cool hide. Except in here, I've got the top mounted radiant heat panel again. So I just put one hide underneath it and one hide over here on the cool side. And again, with her, she spends a lot of her time in the water. And these, these snakes love their water. If you give it to them, they'll stay in it. And then getting up to our bigger snakes, you'll see some people that have got some really uh, cool hides that they'll use, some tubs that they leave the lid on and they cut the side of it out so there's enough room for a big snake to get in there. Um, I like to try and leave them as much room as I can for them to move around with as least as the least amount of obstruction as possible. You know, an eight foot enclosure isn't ideal for a really big snake, but it's acceptable. I try to let them make the most of the space that they've got in there. You know, as you can see, she's back and forth right now. She's moving around. Um, tomorrow night when I get home from work, she's definitely going outside because I think I've almost got her house trained. Last time I took her outside, she went ahead and dropped the loaf out in the yard and didn't do it in her enclosure. So maybe that's what she's trying to tell me right now. So I'll get her outside tomorrow after work. Oh, look at you. Give me a big yawn. <laughs> so talking about temperature gradients, talking about hides. Now you'll see a, a lot of times with the bigger snakes, folks won't put hides in there. The reason why I don't worry about hides with these animals right here is you can see how gregarious she is. There's nothing in here that worries her. She's not the least bit worried about me. She's not the least bit worried about anything in here. This is her house. She's secure in there. My other animals over there are the same way. They're perfectly content. They may use a hide if I put it in there, but it's not affecting their state of mind not having one. So they're perfectly fine. Like I said, I'm just going to leave them enough space. Now, one thing to point out too, if you've got a younger reticulated python, say five, six feet, seven feet, something like that, and you've got a really elaborate setup for them with a lot of branches to climb on, a lot of hides and so forth, really deep, really tall, awesome. But something to keep in mind is that type of enclosure may make it really difficult, if not impossible, to really build a relationship with that animal. And in, and we'll go into this again in, in future videos. I've went into it in past videos. But one thing that you've got to manage is when you open that enclosure and you're going in to interact with that animal, if they've got that standoff right there where they're terrified and they see you coming in, the longer that goes on, the more of an impression that leaves on that animal. So we want to, you know, quickly and confidently but smoothly end that interaction and or you know end that standoff and move into a positive interaction just as quick as we can so with this animal right here and with any of these i can go in here pretty quickly i can reach in and pull them out if they're having a bad day if they're grumpy or something like that and as soon as i get them out once they're in my hands they're mine i don't have to worry about them um, because they know what's going on, they're comfortable, they trust me. Now, if you've got a snake that you've got a lot of hides in there, you've got a lot of places for them to hang on, you may not be able to do that, you know? Um, if you're trying to go in and get this animal out, and, you know, you're moving a hide off, and then you go to pull them out, and their tail wraps around something, everything else is just extending the period of time that that animal's frightened. And <clears throat> it's making it that much harder to kind of overcome... Um, you know, overcome that tension between you guys. Whereas it might take me five seconds to get an animal out of an enclosure and then start working on handling and building that relationship with them. Now it might take you a minute. It might take you two minutes. I mean, you may get, they may get in a position where 
all they're doing is striking at you and you just don't have a good way to get them out of there. So we can go into it really well intentioned, wanting to give them the best life. But with reticulated pythons, one of the keys, and it's just as important to have the right enclosure, but one of the keys is to build that relationship with them because you're not going to wrestle a 16, 18 foot snake like you would a squirrely corn snake. Um, they're smart enough to befriend us and we need to take advantage of that. And if you're putting them in a really elaborate enclosure where you can't easily get to them, that can hinder that. So keep that in mind too. Sometimes with your newer snakes, you may want to wait until you've got that relationship built to throw them in that really elaborate enclosure that you've got all prepared for them. Because you throw a skittish snake in there where they've got a lot of places to hide and a lot of things to hang on to. When you go in to interact with them, they'll hide and they'll hang on to things and it'll make it more difficult. So something to keep in mind. Sometimes it's better to bring that animal home, put them in an enclosure that's not bare. You still give them the hides. You still give them large water receptacles. You just don't make it difficult for yourself to go in and interact with them. And then as that animal starts to get to know you, as you start to build that relationship with them, then you can go ahead and move them into something where it's not going to be that big of a deal. You know, um, an example of this, you know, what it can get to, um, and this is a, this is a funny example, but my, my 16 foot male over there, I had him outside and I would let him climb in the tree out back, but I'd keep an eye on him. And if he'd start going up too high, I'd move him down and so forth. Well, I got distracted one day. I looked the other direction for five seconds. I turn around and he's 12 feet up in the tree. And I can't leave him up there. It was a tall tree, so I had to go up after him. <laughs> so I immediately jump up in the tree. And I've got this 16-foot reticulated python, 12 feet high up in a tree. And I'm finding out just how useless being a mammal with two arms is because it's so easy for him to hang on to everything and anything. And it took me forever and I was wrestling him. I'm so happy he's a good natured snake now. And <laughs> I, I think in a lot of ways he was probably, uh, he was probably laughing at me because he is just all over the place and in my face. And, and I think I seen him smile a couple times, but I got him down. But I mean, just an example, you know, the more elaborate your enclosures are, uh, the more difficulty you're going to have access in those animals sometimes. So just keep that in mind. And to touch on this really quick, of course, I put large water bowls in there with my snakes every now and then on the rarest occasion, I'll see one turned over. Um, my big male will turn his over from time to time. Um, very rarely do I ever see her do it, but sometimes she does it. But I, I keep a water receptacle in there big enough for them to submerge themselves in. And like I said, she was like that today. You definitely want to do that. I'm not a big fan of just putting a dog water dish in there and giving them just enough water to drink. Um, because they actually enjoy the enrichment part of being able to get into that water. And um, it helps them regulate their temperature too. Now I'm not really going to hit enclosure building right now. Because as time goes on, there's going to be a lot more new enclosures being built and I plan on documenting you know all my new builds and stuff like that when I get around to doing them and I get in a position where I can expand and so forth so we're gonna we're planning on doing some pretty awesome builds uh, so that's gonna fall in down the road there so I know the question's gonna come up you know I've got a 16 foot snake how big of an enclosure do I need I've got a 20 foot snake how big of an enclosure do I need um, you know this right here She's a 14 foot female retic with some growing to do, and she's currently in an eight foot enclosure. She's growing out of that enclosure. Um, I'm going to, ultimately I want to get her moved up to a 12 foot long by four foot deep by four foot high enclosure. And it's going to have multiple basking platforms in it and so forth and plenty of places for her to regulate temperature. I'm going to I'm going to devise a really ingenious way of having a big water feature in there with a, with a deck over top of it and so forth so it doesn't suck up all the land space. But like I said, there's some really cool designs in the works. But, you know, you can keep, you know, 14. I've got my 16-footer over there in an 8-foot enclosure right now. And like I said, 
these guys all get out. So when I see them start moving around and wanting to exert some energy, I take them out and let them do that. And then the rest of the time, they're sitting in there pretty much wanting to be left alone. Um, but again, he's getting the same setup. All my enclosures, what my goal is, is to get all my retic enclosures 12 by 4 by 4. And we'll see how that works out. Um, it's going to take a lot more space. Plus, I want to add more animals. So uh, it's going to take me a hot minute to find just the right place to get everybody set up with. And there's, there's kind of an unspoken point that I'm making here, too. And that is... If you're going to get an intelligent reptile like a reticulated python with the intent of putting it in a box and never interacting with it, then I strongly suggest that you adopt that animal out to somebody who's going to interact with it and actually treat it as a member of the family. Because that's how she acts. <laughs> she doesn't act like a snake. She acts like my kid. I come down the stairs. As soon as she sees me, She's on point. She's right up at the glass, nine times out of ten, unless she's just being lazy. You know, these animals are smart, and they enjoy spending time. Oh, man. Which one was that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so Tigger left me a mess. I guess I'm cleaning enclosures some more tonight. Anyway, <laughs> um, like I said, you can make these enclosures work if you're interacting with them and working them. If you're going to leave them in there, if you're afraid to manage them, if you don't have time to manage them all, if you've got too many animals to manage, you really don't want to leave these guys locked up in a box like this and just leave them there. So take that into consideration as well. So a quick down and dirty on enclosures today, guys. I didn't cover everything that can be covered on it. I'm definitely not hitting all of the polar opposite opinions and so forth. There are plenty. There's people that are going to say, man... I've been keeping snakes like this forever. They do just fine. There's going to be other people that say, man, if you don't have a whole room devoted to one snake, you're doing it wrong. I'm not going to sit back and say that either one of those opinions are right or wrong because they've all got their merits and they've all got their place. Um, and one thing to remember is um, we need to understand that people are going to have different opinions on certain things, but um, we, we need to be able to respect the different opinions and the different stances um, outside of what's black and white right and wrong you know there's gonna be differences of opinion on how big an enclosure needs to be what needs to be in there what kind of substrate needs to be in there and we've got to understand that a lot of these different ideas work you know there's an old old phrase that we said in the military quite frequently if it's stupid and it works it's not stupid so we, we do need to kind of temper that a little bit and <clears throat> I'm going to discourage people from getting in there and cutting each other apart saying, well, you're doing this wrong. You're doing that wrong. Well, there are objective things that you can do wrong when you're housing animals, but there's also different ways to do it. And we just need to understand there's different ways to do it and not try and demonize people that do things a little bit differently. So we got a couple more upcoming videos here. Um, it's going to be on socialization, handling, tap training, and reading some behavior and so forth. We're going to get a little bit more advanced stuff out of the way on the reticulated pythons. And I know a lot of that's going to be repetitive material. We've done a lot on that already. But like I said, I'm trying to keep all of this stuff encapsulated so that going through this whole series, you can get a really good overview of everything in one spot. Um, and of course, we do different videos when you're starting a channel and stuff like that. And it's nice to be able to organize everything. So after this, like I said, we're starting on the Nile monitor. That's going to be a lot of fun. He's a lot of fun. And he's a lot more challenging to work with than the reticulated pythons are. So that should be an interesting series. So get subscribed. Get notified as new stuff comes out. You guys have an outstanding weekend. And I will see you next time on Intrepid Exotics.